Cape Horn. Of all the seaways in the world, this was the one most feared by deep water sailors. Until the Panama Canal was opened, the Horn was the only route between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Where the two oceans meet, these fierce waters were the death of many a fine ship. No one needs to go there anymore, but for some intrepid souls, the challenge of the Horn is irresistible. This young woman in a seagoing canoe is one of them. Her name is Rebecca Ridgway, and she'd set her heart on rounding Cape Horn in a canoe. No woman had ever done it before. Rebecca's dream began in 1990, when she was 22. After two hard years training, she found herself at Punta Arenas in Chile. The expedition members unloaded the canoes in a warehouse owned by the Chilean Navy. Rebecca Ridgway has an advantage over other similarly ambitious young women. Her father, and the leader of the expedition, is John Ridgway. He sailed non-stop round the world and is a veteran of many other adventures. The key figure in this expedition is Nigel Dennis, Britain's leading sea canoeist. His experience will be invaluable to the other members. What I'm going to do now is just to brief us on what everybody's role is so that everybody was all here and knows what it is they're doing. The aim is to support Rebecca in her attempt to become the first girl to canoe around Cape Horn. John Ridgway, expedition leader, strategic control of the whole expedition. Nigel Dennis is the lead canoeist and will be responsible for the safety of the canoeists, with particular reference to Rebecca. This is my seventh expedition that I've led to South America. It took 92 days to row across the Atlantic, 203 days to sail non-stop around the world, and I expect the unexpected. The party moved from Punta Arenas by road, 70 kilometers south, down the coast of the Magellan Strait, to the tiny, remote community of Puerto Famín. There they were to meet the support boat, which would launch them on their long paddle. They unpacked the food and equipment they'd need for the trip, and in due course the boat, the Compass Rose, arrived. Loading a canoe is a knack. If by any chance it rolls over, the luggage is supposed to stay inside. Because unless it's so loose that it's just going to drop out, then, then it like might, this, not, need, yeah, we might not need to tie it in if, it, if it's stuck up underneath the pump. Mm. Do you get what I mean? The compass rose was checked carefully by the port authority before the expedition was given clearance to load up. The Chileans are anxious to prevent accidents in the remote and stormy seas around their southern coast. At last, the time came to load the canoes on the support boat to sail to the starting point of the trip. A fully loaded single kayak, six meters long, weighs 50 kilograms. The anchor was weighed and they set off across a calm sea with a steady, gentle swell. Thirty-six hours later, 
they searched for the narrow inlet where the expedition would take to their canoes. They dropped anchor in the sheltered water of the channel and the canoeists assembled their gear for a first experimental paddle in these far southern waters. From here on, the canoes would no longer be carried on board. <laughs> Nigel Dennis discussed safety with the other expert canoeists. Right, you, you do realise that our main job here is to get Rebecca around the horn. Um, we may have problems with John as well because we're actually attempting something that we shouldn't really be attempting with people that have only paddled for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have to do rescues pretty quickly and I think the key to all this is not to get into trouble in the first place. For all their protective clothing, the canoeists wouldn't survive long if they capsized. The icy water takes effect by chilling the brain to the point at which the victim offers no further resistance to the embrace of the ocean. Any high spirits or exhilaration at this stage of the expedition were tempered by that knowledge. <laughs> John Ridgway, outwardly his ebullient self, had worries that his daughter knew well. His age, his state of fitness, and his ability to handle this frail craft. All these doubts were soon to fade, however, when they found themselves among the ice. The glass fibre skin of the canoes is only a couple of millimetres thick. It must be tough enough to withstand grounding on stony beaches and occasional collisions with ice. Paddling tentatively in the calm water, even the leader soon forgot his worries uplifted by the beauty that surrounded the canoeists. Along with the beauty, there is power. Then it was time for the first full day of the 400 kilometer paddle. The greatest strain on a canoeist, especially after a period of inactivity, is on the wrists. At the end of the first day, to everyone's astonished dismay, Nigel Dennis found himself a victim of the canoeist's greatest fear, a swollen wrist. Well, I'm not sure, really, because I've never had a, 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 this problem before. The problem's called tenosylivitis. Um, in all my years of paddling, I've never, ever had it. But uh, for the first time, I'm using a, a different shaped paddle. It's called a cranked paddle, and it's bent in the middle. 
and I can only think that although it's an excellent paddle and it's very comfortable to use, um, just not being used to using it has set it off. Well, as I said at the outset, uh, you do have to expect the unexpected. This is the most unlikely person to get this injury and uh, it will affect the trip if it doesn't get better. But he's a very experienced chap, indeed, as we all know, and uh, we must deal with it sensibly. Nigel was in hospital in Puerto Williams, a small harbour nearby. The doctor diagnosed not wrist strain, but blood poisoning from a small cut on his hand. Red, all yeah. the way down. The cut looked insignificant, but the condition was acute enough to need intravenous antibiotics. It was to be three anxious days before he was able to rejoin the party. When they moved on, Nigel Dennis followed in the support boat for a couple of days. Finally, he rejoined them as they landed for lunch on the second day. How was it coming ashore? All right, well, just a, a little bit uh, sore, but I think it'll be okay. Just taking it very easily. Yeah. I suppose if worse, you could do it with the other hand as well. It's a little bit sore. It's it's not nearly as swollen, is it? No. There's no red there really now. No. That's good. So, just keep the fingers crossed. <laughs> the weather was still fairly calm, if cold and damp. The accommodation and the diet were both basic, not to say Spartan, on the small wooded islands where they broke their journey. Weather forecasts from the Met Office at Bracknell in England were uniformly gloomy. The evening sky was threatening. The next leg of their journey was to take them across the open sea. It was really a gamble against the weather because um, if the wind picks up like some of the... Every day we've had a forecast of four, six, seven, eight, nine and ten. But, but there are some things that we can do to minimise it, like uh, hopefully we'll get on the water for sort of half three, four o'clock. Morning, guys. The crossing, about 35 kilometres, should take six hours. Time enough for the benign weather of the early dawn to turn into something quite different by midday. Uh, Compass Rose is clock one three. It's uh, three thirty in the morning. The weather looks good. We're going to attempt the crossing. See you shortly. Very nice. For John and Rebecca Ridgway, the least experienced members of the group, this would be the first real test. Once out on the open water, they would be at the mercy of the weather. And, as usual, the forecast was bad. The compass rose would be following them, but if the sea became too rough, rescuing capsized canoeists would be far from easy. As the hours passed, the weather deteriorated. The wind became stronger, though not as strong as Brackman had predicted. In mid-channel, in worsening conditions, the experts kept an anxious eye on their less experienced charges. As the further shore came into view, they struggled on in a cold, grey and threatening sea. From time to time they rested, holding the canoes together in a raft for stability. When they arrived on the beach at the far side, the captain of the support boat was unable to conceal his relief that they were all safely ashore. The Force 10, predicted by Bracknell, arrived half an hour later. 
but at least the next forecast was better. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, Nigel, I have the latest satellite information from Bracknell for you for the remainder of Sunday, the 19th of January. Wind, southwest 7, a severe gale 9, increasing 4 to 5, and becoming northwest during the afternoon. Sea, very rough, becoming moderate to slight, but large swell persisting around the Cape. Weather, rain and steady showers. They pressed on through the Wollaston Islands, the southernmost of which was their goal, Cape Horn. A group of giant petrels showed no alarm as they passed. Ghostly wailing sounds coming from a cave proved to be the calls of a tribe of sea lions. Getting in was easy, but getting out against the swirling water was another matter. But there were consolations. On one calm day, they were escorted for a while by a small group of dolphins. Finally, they could see the summit of Cape Horn Island itself, a sight which gladdened their hearts as much as it depressed the spirits of the old deep water mariners in their sailing boats. There are very few landing places on Cape Horn Island. On the eastern side, there's a small rocky inlet at the foot of tall cliffs. Here they paused to gather their forces for the final assault. Two of them had been here before. Well, here we are, Igor, back on Cape Horn again. Uh, Almost exactly three years since we were here last. We might as well read what we put at the time. Well, you can re read yours first. Here we go. Hmm. Fine weather. Very good to see that light from the landward side after passing twice under sail. Papa's ass. Hmm. You put... I put something. Uh, not sure what I'm doing here, but the weather's fantastic. I can die a happy man. <laughs> well, tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> this will be tomorrow. <laughs> They made another early start, leaving the beach while it was still dark in the quiet hours before the dawn. The weather forecast was better than most, but it had been wrong before. There was no knowing what might be in store. For Rebecca, this was the culmination of two years training and planning, pushing off a foreign beach into the darkness of a forbidden ocean.
The rest of the party prepared for takeoff. Soon they were all gathered into a flotilla, including John Boyce, the all important cameraman who was to record the event for the world. Good luck, fellas. As dawn came up, the sea was kind on this lee side of the island. Round to the northwest lay the unknown, where wind and tide could be making life difficult for small craft. When they got there, they began to see Cape Horn in its true colours, the grey and green of troubled waters. A potential problem was the Klopotis effect, in which waves can rebound from the cliffs to form huge, unstable mounds of water. If the swell grew any larger, Nigel Dennis would shepherd his charges away from the cliffs. Only near disaster happened to the camera boat, while John Boyce was filming and his paddler, Chris Unsworth, was handling the craft alone. Fortunately, the camera kept running. no more serious alarms. Exactly six hours after they'd started, they found themselves passing the headland into the small inlet they'd left in the dark. To celebrate the first rounding of Cape Horn by a woman in a canoe, three of the paddlers performed victory rolls. Only one of them completed the manoeuvre. That was the measure of their exhaustion. Among the champagne and the cheers, all the canoeists were aware that luck had played its part in their success, as well as planning, training and sheer determination. Their feelings were mixed as they looked their last on these dark, brooding waters. For Rebecca Ridgway, it was the culmination of a dream, a peak in her life. Her father was proud of Rebecca's achievement, but was sorry to come to the end of their great adventure. It's just that it's rather sad, you know, that it's come to an end and that travelling hopefully is always better than arriving and it was a really good idea and, um, and now it's over. Ha, 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 ha.